I come to you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Good to see you all this morning on this beautiful day. You all I know remember as a child playing this game, maybe now as an adult playing this game with your children or grandchildren. Simon says, touch your nose. Simon says, touch your toes. Oh, Lordy. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Simon says, raise your hands in the air and take a step forward. I took a step forward. I'm out. I lost. That old game of Simon says, you only do what Simon says to win the game. It is the person that listens the most carefully and follows the directions exactly what Simon says, only what Simon says, when Simon says, how Simon says. And any variation on that, you lose. Well, it's a fun game. But whether we want to realize it or not, there's something about how we're raised and how we live and how our culture and our systems shape us and make us that we live with what Simon says so often. We think we're these wonderful individuals, these creative minds. I walk my own path. I forge my own path. Like we're all living with this great machete cutting our way through the woods. I'm going to make my own path, the road less traveled. No. Most of us just do what Simon says. Pick your Simon. Be it the culture, a family system, society, the policy manual, what your boss says, what the church says, what somebody says, Simon says. Because somehow you've been taught, if you do what Simon says, you'll get what you want. So the culture says, Simon says, if you want to get there, this is how you do it. And you pretty much learn quickly when you get a new job or something, how that system works at job and how the system works at that job culture. And Simon says, if you want to make it in this job and climb your way up the ladder, you better do what Simon says. And you learn in relationships and family systems how Simon works and what you need to do. And even the church will say, Simon says. So do what we want. That is, if you want to get to heaven. If not, that's okay. Just go to hell. Simon says. So we live in that culture. We live in that way. So I want us to sort of critically think about this Simon and what Simon's about because that's what happens today in the gospel. So Jesus is teaching in the synagogue and he's there and he, and he sees this woman who's been suffering, bent over for 18 years. And she doesn't call out to him. She doesn't say, Lord, 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 heal me, please. He sees her, recognizes her suffering, casts out the demon, and he heals her on the Sabbath. Now, quickly, the, the elders are irritated and agitated. And how can this be? Because Simon says one must never do work on the Sabbath day. Simon says you know better than that, Jesus. Simon says you cannot heal, Jesus, on the Sabbath day. And Jesus goes, oh, well, that's interesting. I know what Simon says, but I think Simon's wrong. I think there's another thing to do, another way to be. So Jesus questions Simon. And Jesus goes, by the way, Simon does say, well, you're allowed, right, to untie your donkey and to let them get some water? Oh, yes, Simon says. Well, why would you be allowed to take your donkey and to give your donkey some water? Well, because it would be cruel to the animal. The animal has to have water. It's not work. It's not work on the Sabbath if I do that. My animal has to have water to live. But it's work. And Simon says that to heal this woman, I can't. Well, Jesus basically says, Simon's wrong. I'm healing the woman. Jesus constantly questions again and again and again our systems and our structures and our policies and our manuals and our traditions and our way of being and how we do things again and again and again and again. And he asks why. Just because Simon says doesn't make it so. 
And the amazing thing in this lesson that I was thinking of, the amazing thing in this lesson is that it had been kept, become so ingrained within the culture and the society and the expectations of even those who suffered. Because if Jesus would have said to the suffering woman, oh, I'm teaching in the synagogue, oh, suffering one, I see you, oh my gosh. But you know what? Today's the Sabbath day. So I'm going to take my donkey to get some water, but I can't heal you. I'll come back tomorrow. She would have said, great. Great. You're going to come back tomorrow? Really? I mean, I've been suffering for 18 years. I'll take tomorrow. I mean, in the system of Simon Says, that sometimes even those who suffer, even those who are oppressed, even those who are beaten down, even those who are outcast, begin to believe that what Simon says is true. And they wait. Or they say, this is the life I'm supposed to live. Because Simon says, my lifestyle is unholy. Because Simon says that somehow I'm not worthy of being included. Because Simon says that I'm an outcast, I'm odd, I'm weird, I'm different, I'm whatever. I'm unclean, I'm unworthy, so I guess I must be unclean. I guess I must be unworthy. I guess there's a reason why I'm not welcome in your church. There's a reason why I can't take communion with you. There's a reason my way of life can't be honored in your midst because Simon says... There's a reason society is set up the way it is. There's a reason why the rich are the rich and the poor are the poor. There's a reason why these people live here and those people live there. There's a reason why some people make it and some people don't because Simon says. So, that's why I'm here. That's why I've been waiting for 18 years. And I'll wait another day. And Jesus goes, no, 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 no. I don't care what Simon says. You're not going to wait one more second for healing. You're not going to wait one more second to know freedom. You're not going to wait one more second to, be, to begin to live into the fullness of who God calls you to be and what God intends for your life. You're not going to wait one more second. I don't care what Simon says because I think Simon's wrong. So with all that being said, a rather long sort of prelude, I suppose, or introductory comments. That's what we're doing now in this church, in Trinity Church, with this survey, with this values exercise. It has something to do with picking out these words, but more than that, it is to engage us in conversation about who we are and what we do. And what Simon says around this place. But what Simon says we are and who we are. Just because the Anglican tradition says something doesn't mean that's how Simon says that God, the Spirit is calling us now. Just because that's the way the Vestry said it in 1978 does not mean that's how we have to do it now. Just because somebody somewhere, some off said it doesn't mean we have to do it now. Just because our Trinity tradition says that Simon says this is how we do it doesn't mean we have to do it now. Doesn't mean it's right. Just because the, Chris, the Princeton culture says this is how we do it. Or our club says this is how we do it. Or our notion of something says this is how we're supposed to do it. Doesn't mean it's right. Doesn't mean it's what we're supposed to do. Doesn't mean it's who God is calling us to be. Just because we've done something in this church for 190 years does not mean that's the way it's supposed to be or the way it has to be, or the way it will be. Because God is constantly doing a new thing. Constantly working in and through our lives. The Holy Spirit, we don't say, is the Holy Spirit at work? The Holy Spirit is constantly at work in and through us to open our eyes to new understandings, our hearts to new revelations, our souls to new possibilities. So we are going to engage ourselves in conversation about what it means to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ in this place. And we're going to talk about what Simon has been saying to us. And how these things have been dictating our lives and what we do. And it is not about what Paul Jeans said. And it is not about what Kara says or what Joanne says or what the warden says. 
It's about us coming together as a community of believers, trying to find our way, opening ourselves up with our sins and our imperfections, trying to follow the Spirit of God, trying to say how, this is how we are going to live as the people of God in this particular time, this particular place, this particular context, with our particular struggles to more fully live into the gospel of Jesus Christ. Back on July 10th, I think it was, the gospel message was, what must we do to inherit eternal life? The Lord said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments. Hang all the law and the prophets. In the gospel of Matthew and Mark, the question was asked, what's the greatest commandment of all? The same answer. The same same basic question and answer that we had going on. All of this survey and question and conversation is to help us find a way that we can love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves a little better, just a little more faithfully, still woefully imperfect. But for us to engage with our heart and souls the tough questions of what it means to be a Christian today and here. And sometimes we're going to come to the realization Simon was wrong. The Spirit says this. This is what we're called to do. This is who we're called to be. And it's going to take some work. And guess what? Some people aren't going to be happy. And they're going to be irritated. Welcome to life and to living in community. Some leaders are going to be mad. So what? That's what we have to do, I think, to faithfully wrestle with who we are and who God is calling us to be. So I encourage you, whether you fully understand what these questions are, what the values are, what it is, just take it and ponder it and pray over it and circle three or write three or contact one of us and say, I don't understand the thing. And then you can meet with Kara or me or Joanne and talk about it. But I want you to at least engage it in some way. And we've had about 60 or so surveys come in thus far. And guess what? This is going to blow your mind. We don't all agree. There is a great bit of diversity and divergence on what we think we're about as the followers of Jesus Christ. We are not of one mind. There's not been three answers that have come in over and over and over and oh, no, dear ones. Now, there are three or four or five that are sort of kind of bubbling up a little bit, but there is a whole baseline of great differences about what you believe this place is to be about and where your heart is and what you think our values are as followers of Jesus Christ. Does that surprise anybody? No. And guess what? We live in Princeton, so everybody thinks they're right. When I first arrived here, I'm telling you more than I should. When I first arrived here, very first day, someone said to me, Paul, welcome to Mount Olympus where everybody thinks they're a god. (laughs) Number two, they said, don't let anybody see a chink in your armor or they will tear you up. And I go, okay, well, welcome. Home sweet home. (laughs) We are not gods. We are not perfect. We're broken people trying to find our way with all kinds of chinks and bruises and fears and insecurities. So I just want us to sit with some time and see how we can love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, just a little bit more faithfully, maybe a little bit more honestly maybe in a new way, realizing that God is doing something new in and through us. And out of that, we are going to begin maybe in a new way to love our neighbor in a way we never thought possible before. Love our neighbors ourselves. So, sisters and brothers, I don't know what Simon is saying, but I want us to figure out what the Lord is saying and where the Lord is calling us. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.